Okay, so I think, I think we should be good. Um, if anyone, I just want to make sure, can you all see the, um, the geospatial centroid website right now? You can just unmute and say yes. Yes, I can see it. Okay, thank you. There's a lot of things going on on a tiny screen here. All right, so we're here today for, um, whoops, and now we're looking at that. Okay, we're here today for how the states got their shapes, but I always do a shameless plug for a geospatial centroid uh, event. So here we have the geospatial centroid web webpage, gs.colostate.edu. We have an events link, which now goes to, um, it's actually hosted through the library calendar now. Um, so we have a few events. There's a Python workshop, only one seat left. We have another seminar next week, uh, and yours the week after. It's technically a workshop. The open, open source, source JS solutions. solutions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so we have a couple of workshops and seminars in the next month. So take a look uh, at the calendar and see what fits into your schedule. This is our first seminar of the semester, and um, I'm excited about it. I had fun making my slides. Yeah. All right. So we're going to actually have Kevin will go first talking about Oklahoma. It's And display centers. Duplicate solution. Okay. So now there's no notes though. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Oh, that's good. All right. Hello everyone. My name is Kevin Worthington. I work um, at the Geospatial Centroid. I am the Map and GIS Data Specialist. And it also means I get to, you know, get roped into fun presentations like this one. So there's actually a book called How the States Got Their Shapes. And um, it's actually available here at Morgan Library. Pretty cool book. Um, talks a lot about each of the states and goes into some detail. So I definitely reference that and I put a little link to resources at the end of this presentation. So this is all about Oklahoma and, you know, as part of the research, it really revealed how Oklahoma was formed as a result of indigenous American displacement and the struggle to abolish slavery. Um, I chose this state not because of its obviously odd shape, but because I read a book called um, like Killers of the Flower Moon, which I also referenced at the end of it. And it goes into um, some, I guess like more recent history, history in like the last hundred years about um, some residents of Oklahoma mm -hmm. and how there was this crazy genocidal thing that was going on, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. So a little bit of an introduction of Oklahoma. Uh, the, the name was derived from two uh, Choctaw words, uh, Okla and Kuma, uh, which translates to people read. Um, there's a link to where you can do more Choctaw translations. Um, this land was formerly uh, considered for the reestablishment of a French colonial empire, if you can imagine that. But, um, you know, the French weren't actually really in control of the land and um, just made sense to, to sell it to the United States in, in 1803. Um, but because it wasn't controlled, the, the states were actually purchasing um, just like the rights to inhabit the land or to obtain um, the lands by treaty or by conquest. Um, and so there was, there was a lot of work ahead of them um, or of us to, to actually occupy this land. And obviously it's like a super sad story, um, but the purchase was as part of this Louisiana purchase, as you can see here of 1803. And so it was bought, brought, uh, bought by France. Uh, and the price adjusted dollars looking at this article, the true cost of the Louisiana purchase showed that uh, 2012 adjusted values, it was like 308 million. And this purchase price was touted as being like, oh, such a steal of a deal. Um, but of course there were uh, over like 222 concessions since then. And um, the adjusted price is, you know, 18 or 8.5 billion. Um, but still, you know, it's like, it is nowhere near like a fair market price for like the land that was purchased when it was clearly inhabited by others. So the US was purchasing the right to 
try to occupy this land so that others wouldn't stake claim on it. And so that's what that purchase was. So I'm gonna go through each of the borders. Uh, we'll start with the Western border. And um, you know, this, this Western border was established as part of the Treaty of Adams Onus. And that was really to purchase Florida from Spain. And so you can kind of see here on the right, there's Florida. And this boundary was basically established at um, the 100th um, meridian there. And so that, that was the, the Western border and this, this excludes the panhandle. So you can kind of see a bit of a zoom in here. So here's the, the Western border at, oops, at 100 West. And then same thing here on the, the left um, as well. So that was the Western border. Um, going forward, looking at the eastern border of uh, Oklahoma, you can see that first it started with Arkansas. And so in 1821, the territory of Arkansas was established and it occupied all the area of Oklahoma as well. But, you know, at the same time, um, there was also this, um, this Doak stand of 1820, and that was basically removing the Choctaw tribe to um, or from the Mississippi to occupy this land in Oklahoma. And as part of that, there was this um, this border uh, established. So you can kind of see here on the bottom right what this border should have looked like, and it technically should have continued down from um, from Missouri, but as part of this um, DOAC stand, the indigenous people were technically given too much land <laughs> as part of this. And um, so you can kind of see this irregular line that sort of like breaks a bit and this map doesn't really do it justice, but it is far from straight. It does like a little bit of a curve and this red line would be that straight line. Um, and then this point that was established, that's actually um, Fort Smith. And so that was the, the eastern border of Arkansas and that was established. It was 100 paces west of Fort Smith. And um, you know, it goes south from, there's the Red River. Um, can't really see it so well on this map. We can jump onto the next slide to look at that. Um, I'm going to the northern border and um, it's interesting because Oklahoma is the only state to occupy the 37th and um, 36th and 30 minute parallels. And why 36 and um, 30 minutes is important is because of slavery. Um, I'm not actually um, from the United States. So I, I learned a lot about the history and why that was important. Basically any state that was North of this line um, was a free state. It meant that slavery was not allowed. Any state that was South of that line, um, you could actually have slavery. And so when Texas entered the union in 1846, they wanted slavery maintained. And um, so as a result of this, they surrendered this land that existed at the North End. And so that's how that, um, that panhandle started. They're like, huh, you know, <laughs> We want slavery and we can't have it if we have this part of land. And so they they basically like donated it. Um, yeah, and so Texas was able to maintain slavery, but then there was um, a Kansas-Nebraska Act, Act of 1854 and that relegated the, uh, Missis uh, sorry, the Missouri Compromise, uh, which basically meant that, oh, every new state that entered as part of the union could have slavery now. And so that border, um, that 36 and three quarter didn't matter after that point. And so um, Congress actually altered Kansas's line to come down to the 30, um, or actually to go up, sorry, it went north. So Kansas lost some land in this process, um, but Texas never got their land back, um, which kind of leads me to the last, um, border that we'll cover. And this is the, the southern border, or no, we're, we're at the southern border. And in 1890, uh, Congress created the Treaty of Oklahoma. And as part of that, Oklahoma finally became, you know, its own state. Um, but I think Texas was bitter about this. And they were like, oh, well, you know, that the northern border really shouldn't go to, um, you know, this like, one stretch of the Red River, it should go like, it should go higher. And then um, 
when it, I guess, went through the courts, Oklahoma won because um, there was actually a larger segment of the Red River. And so I'm sure Texas was super bitter about losing that little part of land, but um, it was in fact, um, you know, I guess add insult to injury, Oklahoma got some more land out of it. And you might think, oh, Oklahoma created a state. That means that all the indigenous Americans would then get title to lands and everything would be would be gravy, right? Like, why why not? Um, except, you know, I, I did some some further readings on the subject, and um, even the, this book that I'll talk about suggests um, that was clearly not the case. So to start, it said that um, from this uh, American Indians link that you can check out, and we'll share the slides. Um, it says many um, Oklahoma Indians became U.S. citizens upon receiving land allotments. Um, but they ultimately lost their lands by fraud and deception um, from white opportunists. And, um, you know, it's like, oh, that's that's really rough. And actually, after this book that I'm going to mention um, was released, there was this Indian Reorganization Act that was supposed to you know, really help out, um, like the Indigenous Americans. Um, but it exempted those in Oklahoma for whatever reason. I'm sure that was like a political move. Um, but the, the book that really got me thinking about Oklahoma was um, called Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, Martin Scorsese is actually making a movie, which I think comes out next month. And this this book is great. So this, this author, David uh, Gran, went into detail um, about what was going on. He did so much research after the fact to try to give closure to what had been happening there. And basically what um, what, what occurred in, in this area of Oklahoma, there was a tribe of Osage um, Indians or Native Americans, and they were rich beyond any other community in the entire US because they were on such a black gold mine. It was oil land, crazy oil land. So if you can imagine, they were first displaced, right, from Mississippi, put on this land, uh, which was deemed at the time to be just like, you know, the worst land, you know, there was nothing better to do with it. It was barren. They made it their home, you know, probably you know, losing a lot of people in the process. I think spoke of um, the migration from the Mississippi to Oklahoma. A lot of people lost their lives in that process. So, you know, when they finally did set up um, this, this one tribe, you know, became so rich. And this, this book goes into that. Um, but there were these white opportunists that started, you know, figuring out, like, how can we get title to these lands? And there was so much, like, shady business going on. Um, yeah, and it was, like, it was heart-wrenching, but it was a really, like, a who's done it? Because you're in this town, and you're like, oh, all these people are dying. Like, what's happening? And this is at a time around, like, 1920, where, like, they couldn't really detect poisoning so well. And so it was really, like, early-age forensics. Um, and so the creation of the FBI was actually established from the, ca the case that was happening in this area because it had to be, um, you know, like governed federally because locally, um, you know, there was so much corruption, like no one was doing proper investigations on this and anyone who got too close would suddenly die. And so it was like, it was super suspicious, true story, really, really fascinating and heart-wrenching at the same time, but I think an important one. Um, and then, you know, the, the last link here is just um, the, the reference material that spoke of the different states. So yeah, super interesting um, history for this the state. And I don't know if I should open it up to any questions that you might have on this. We got time. If there's any questions, I also I also have a comment. You can put stuff in the chat too. Oh, cool. Does anyone online we'll start with have any questions? You can just unmute yourself. No? How about in the room? Has anyone been to Oklahoma? You have. Yeah. What is it? What's it like? <laughs> My mom's whole family's from Oklahoma. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was like, how would you feel if you lived in Hope? I mean, like living anywhere in the US is like obviously like stolen land. Um, 
And it almost seems like in Oklahoma, they've like tried to like make wrongs right, at least, but it definitely made it worse. Yeah, it, um, it was pretty clear that that was the case. Ashley says she hit a deer towards Carl. Wow, <laughs> that's rough. Okay. That's it. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, let's do that. Thank you. Yeah, a little history of the U.S. Even that you know, I learned about what the War of 18 Paul when the U.S. invaded Canada. That was my American history. For our intermission, I will put our calendar back up on the screen. I'm I'm a show. I'm a show. It's true. Okay. Um, all right, Colorado. Hold on. <laughs> you go away. Zoom is complicated. Duplicate slideshow. All right. Colorado. It's not really a rectangle. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> so, this is what Colorado looks like, right? We're used to it. This was. Um, of course, now I can't see my notes. I want to say 1870. This is good job of maybe 1870, maybe? Can't. It's in my notes. So I can share my slides. All right. So the story of Colorado shape kind of can kind of be boiled down into two uh, categories: delimitation and demarcation. So there's the official, like how Congress decreed Colorado should be drawn, and then how it was. Demar demarcated, demarcated, surveyed when it was surveyed, and they are they are a little bit different. So let's talk about delimitation first. This is the actual. There it is. This is the actual. Um, uh, the report, the papers, the congressional papers from the 36th Congress from 1861, where they decide right here. It's written in writing. I know it's hidden by some yellow. Um, where it says that Colorado should be commencing on the 37th parallel of north latitude or the 25th meridian of longitude. This is very wordy. 25th meridian of longitude west from Washington crosses the same, thence north on said meridian to the 41st parallel, then I said west to the 32nd meridian of longitude west from Washington, and a few more sentences there. So all of, all of this is saying it should be this. That's, that's what it's saying saying 25th meridian west of Washington and 32, 32nd meridian west of Washington and then 37 to 41. So I think we're familiar with 37 and 41, like that seems right to us, but what is our longitude here in Colorado that we know of? Take, take some guesses, roughly. Yeah. Like longitude, longitude. Yeah, like you're here in Fort Collins where I've got 105. So it's actually 102 and change and 109 and change from the prime meridian Greenwich, England. But there were these things called Washington meridians. So they had a series of, I think I have a picture. Oh, hold on. I have a picture later. They had a series of different meridians that were based on Washington, where Washington was the zero, Washington, D.C. Huh was the zero. So that's the terminology here. So it's from the 25th to the 32nd Washington Meridian, which is really about 102 to 109. And so if we think of it like this, it is a rectangle if we look at it in a geographic coordinate system. So we're breaking into the geography. So that's what it looks like. But of course the world is round and we don't use geographic coordinate systems if we can avoid them as we're learning, right, Emily? Right. Um, so this is what Colorado looks like. This is in UTM. Um, this is what this is UTM, which is a transverse Mercator projection, but any conic projection would make it look kind of like that too. So really it's an isosceles trapezoid. There's more to it than that though. All right, so where are those Washington Marines? So here's a picture of them. So obviously here's Washington here. And you can kind of see they had a series of these different meridians that were just made for the, the US, this new baby country that was just developing and they made their own meridians. They are no longer used, but that's what they were. Uh, and what they were trying to do with a lot of the Western states in 
an effort for equality, both of those go in a, a big air quotes, uh, was have this series of uh, meridians that were seven degrees. So, so Colorado is seven degrees of longitude. Um, and then there's these other sort of consistency that you'll see with some of the lines of longitude of our Western states. And then for the lines of latitude, the plain states are three degrees uh, tall. And then the mountain states, three of them at least, are four degrees tall. So there was some kind of consistency in there. They were trying to kind of even things out somehow, but it really kind of fell apart because it's not, clearly, it's not a uniform grid. But that's what they were originally sort of intending to plan. Like the US government had a plan to keep it organized. And then it just it didn't really work. But that's kind of where we fall. So that's what Colorado wound up being. But Colorado originally was part of four different territories. So Nebraska, Kansas, Utah, New Mexico. So here's the line of Colorado in there. And it spanned four different territories. And if you take note, where, where do these territories get split? The rivers. The rivers. Well, actually, that's the continental divide, it's the watersheds. So John Wesley Powell had a great idea to create states based on catchment areas, on watersheds, so that water rights would be more, I'm not going to say this right, um, so that water rights would be distributed to the people who live there. The people who live, see, the, the people who live in a place would be using the water that, you know, <laughs> am I saying it right? Um, the water would be coming from where you live. How about that? That's what I'm going to say. Uh, as we all know, that didn't happen either, though. So John Leslie Powell's idea kind of got poo-pooed by the government. Uh, so that's what it wound up being. Ah. So this is what it started out with. And the original proposition for turning this into a state, aside from John Leslie Powell, was actually do this. And I don't know why I drew my line so tall for the for these ones, but it was it was proposed that this proposed Jefferson territory was going to be from 35 degrees latitude, not 37, and up to 42, not 41. So the 42 would have lined it up with Washington or sorry, Oregon and Idaho. And then having it go down to 35 would have made it just the same width, but just a little bit taller. And the reason for that is because Colorado, as it was currently like broken up by four territories, no single territory had a lot of different resources. So doing it this way, you would get agricultural land and minerals. So there's a lot of gold. There's a lot of gold in their hills, right? Not, not as much as people hoped. But that's what they were hoping, to have one territory that had Agriculture and or does anyone like to learn? Yes. <laughs> That's the whole point of the game. Is of everything. So where you live, you have all of it there. That they were trying to play Catan back in the mid 1800s. Um, as we all know, that that didn't happen either. And we wound up with Colorado, just as it has been shaped. So that's what Congress decreed it to be. Now, what is it actually shaped as? So let's talk about demarcation. So somewhere, uh, I don't know when, somewhere in the mid to late 1800s, the US government decided the great wide wild west needs to be mapped, it needs to be surveyed. So they organized, it's called the Four Great Surveys, which John Wesley Powell was one of them. Hayden was another one, he did Colorado. Wheeler and King, I don't, I don't remember their first names. King, I think, did the Northwest. And if you know Seattle's and King County, so all those names come into play. Um, but they sent out these four great surveys to map the, the West in general. But as part of that, they also were mapping state boundaries. So the Colorado state boundary, I believe, was not uh, actually surveyed for the state boundary itself until like 1879. Uh, but when they did that, they used GIS. Right? Now, what do we all know GIS really stands for? Get it surveyed. So they use survey techniques. Of course, we're talking not like your Trimble total station with your little rangefinder thing. We're talking like 
giant towers and chains, literal chains <laughs> and towers. So they, this is how they did it. All of their surveying was done by line of sight. So they would have to get to their baseline or their, their starting point and um, go do what? We need to follow a line of, launch, uh, line of latitude. What's to get from, actually, I think they started in the West and went east. So they started in the West and then they went toward Oklahoma. Um, but they had to follow the line. So they would get up on a janky tower, but they would build on the spot with materials there. In some cases, they would carry it with them. Um, these towers went anywhere from 50 to even well over 200. And this was in the 1800s, so they were all done using wood. Later on, they were done using metal. So Bilby Towers and something Pipe Towers were done using metal, and they were a little bit more stable. But obviously, if you were climbing up on this thing and shooting your declination, like, okay, I need to get to that tree. But if you wobble, you're like, oh, wait, no, I need to get to that rock. So you want it to be stable. So this is how they did the survey. They would climb up, shoot a line of sight, many miles. I mean, they would be shooting many miles, but then they would have to make that mark and then climb down, dismantle it, and then walk cross country, straight line. How many of you ever tried to walk in a straight line across <laughs> terrain? It's really hard. Mountains and terrain, and like your body naturally wants to walk downhill. And so this is where the problem comes in with the shape of Colorado. So that's what they did. There were a lot of mistakes. Uh, for what they had, though, it's amazingly accurate. And it's pretty amazing that not more, more people died during this. Um, I don't know what OSHA, OSHA was not around then. Um, but this, this map here was taken from an article that I've actually used a couple times uh, from Big Think and also Atlas Obscura. It was a nicer map than I could make on my own. I don't have time to remake a map like that. So here are a couple of the bigger errors in Colorado. So I'm um, starting in the corner. First of all, the four corners monument is a little bit off. There's that. Um, and then if you look on the border, there's a few little jogs like this, and you can you can actually see them. Um, this one here is 860 meters off. So they were just a little bit off, and then they realized it, and they're like, oh. <laughs> and then they would just continue, right? So they would correct themselves. And then over here, they went from west to east, Somewhere over here, it just kind of drifted southward. <laughs> um, here, it's really flat and there's really no trees. So you can't really blame the terrain on that one. They just drifted. Uh, and then over here, kind of same thing. And these are big enough to see just by scrolling around the map of Colorado. There's a few on the northern boundary too. Uh, and if you look in OpenStreetMap, here's two examples. So here's that one big jog on the south border. Uh, there's, they'll say, uh, Mexico. And then here's the other one. Um, this is the LaSalle Mountains over here. This would be like way west of Montrose over here. So they're pretty big, some of them. Uh, but there are so many of those. Does anyone know how many of those there are? How many sides Colorado has? Because it's, it's not four, it's <laughs> hundreds. So there's so many of these little jobs in here. There are actually 697 sides to what looks like it should be a rectangle. Yeah. And it's all because of the way it was surveyed. So you may be asking, are you thinking of any questions right now? Uh, well, why are they didn't use triangulation if a cold itself? Uh, I'm sure they did, but it's not it exact. Right. Yeah, it's not exact. And they're, they're shooting declinations. In one case I read, they could be up to like 20 miles away if the line of sight is clear enough. And they're building these towers so that they can get above the trees and shoot it. So I mean, this, is bad. I mean, this one's really bad. Some of them are only, you know, dozens of feet off. Um, but I think they, I think they did. Here's the best. Well, yeah, 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 actually, there's, yeah, there were a couple where if you look at it, and even in the book or the article, it even says, like, it's very obvious they just kind of get stuck in the drainage. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you have questions? Um, yeah, I was going to comment on the fact that the river is there and also wondered how some of the other states might have adjusted, like, 
So to like boundaries. Yeah. So to like make sure they're aligning themselves with others. Right. Yeah. We need we need to follow good topological rules, right? Adjacency, yeah. connectivity, yeah. containment. So we need to make sure our features are adjacent. So you may be wondering, well, okay, well now we have better tools. Why didn't we just fix it? Can I ask? Yeah. So uh, for according to the law, what the border is like in documents or demarcation? That's exactly the question. Why didn't they fix it? In 1925, there was a Supreme Court case that said the way it was surveyed is now the law of the land. And so even though it was decreed by Congress that it should just be the lines of latitude and longitude, how they surveyed it with all of its little errors is now the legal shape of Colorado. And to fix it would be a huge mess because of adjacent states you would have to get the states to agree on who land is whose, and that would also take another act of Congress. So they didn't do that. Like, that's hard. So they just left it how it is. Was there any, like, problems? Because it's like, there were definitely points where they were kind of taking land from other states or, like, giving them more land. I, all, like, I'm i sure there was. I didn't read anything specifically about that. But I'm sure there had to have been. I think the most uh, uh, big question with climate plants, but it can be compensation. So keep in mind, this is also in the late 1800s, where I don't know. I don't know if a lot of the land was even claimed yet. So I don't know how much private land there was in terms of like Homestead Act and when people were claiming up the land. So I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure. It might not have been that big of an issue. Right, and, the, and so the surveyors, surveyors, when they were going out there, they were sort of working off the decrees from Congress and trying to get the best match. In other words, they weren't working for each state. They were no. working at the federal level, so that's why there wouldn't be the conflict necessarily, because they right. were declaring it. The, yes. survey, the surveys, well, most of the surveys, and of the four great surveys, three of them were publicly funded by the federal government. I think... I can't remember which one it might have been John Leslie Powell, which was actually privately funded somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and then I want to say they decided they won't do private anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder why that was. Um, but yeah, they were publicly funded by the federal government. So they were serving the greater good, right? But hopefully not private interest. Yeah. So then, like, in the places where there was really, really tall mountains, like the southern border, and, like, but yeah, they just go straight up the mountain. I, ideally, it's I mean, line. it's line of sight. So you climb up on your sketch tower and you shoot as far as you can. Like, that's my declination. That's my due north. And then you climb back down and you have to get there. So maybe, oh. maybe you get there this way, but then you have to get there. And then you leave your mark because they made some survey monuments. So um, survey monuments and markers could be trees, they could be rocks, they could be piles of rocks, and that would be what you would shoot for. Like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna go toward that pile of rocks next to Sophie, and that's my survey marker. Yeah, and of course, now we still see those survey we markers. We do, we do still see those survey markers. Yeah, and, it says yeah, and yeah, so now we have more official, the brass benchmarks that are like into the ground, right? But in some places, um, you you can still find the old survey monuments, which are um, piles of rocks or tree. Ha have you ever seen a bearing tree, like out in the woods when you're hiking? I know that there's one down the Lady Moon Trail somewhere. There's a bearing tree. So it's literally like a tree. This tree is the monument. This is the marker of the corner of the section, whatever. It's all the same system. So it's pretty cool. And who is... Who is pay the taxes for this uh, non-understandable land. <laughs> <You're Even real>. <laughs> <laughs> Who pays for it? I don't know. Because uh, like two states and this line. So the line no is market, now, and the line. For example, private uh, right. owners need to pay taxes. So I think the way it's drawn is it's not that we have an overlap. It's just the line, the border is just crooked. And so, like in this one here, like you, Utah get, get got that. New Mexico gets this. Colorado gets this. So there's no there's no double counting of the taxes. Yes, but in documents, 
Yeah, so, so and this this is why coordinate accuracy and surveys. All right, so why didn't they just fix it? Because the Supreme Court said so. Uh, so of course that's that's our state of Colorado. Um, Colorado, which became a state in 1876, which is why its nickname is the Centennial State. Uh, it has four four sides. It's one of two states that has four sides. And it's one of three states that only has straight line edges. What's the other state that has straight line edges only? Utah. Okay, fun fact. What's the only state that has no straight line edges? Let's see if anyone, you can put it in the chat too. Hawaii, because oh, it's all islands. Um, and Marcy, by the way, great to see you, Marcy. Um, who brought that Supreme Court case? I don't. I didn't look that up. It wasn't. It wasn't in the thing, and I didn't look it up. But I can find out for you. And which state's bigger? It's like Colorado. Um. Well, they're they're both four degrees in height, and I think they're both four degrees in in so width. So I. It might just be a projection. So this is in UTM zone 13. And so you, Wyoming might be getting a little weird. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is an excellent question. How many sides does Wyoming have? Wyoming was not immune to the survey errors. And I don't, I could not find a number for it. Wyoming secret edges. So this came from the same article. Um, so there are a lot of weird things in Wyoming as well, but I could not find like the number of edges. And I tried, I actually got the data from a few different sources to try to see if I could tell by the number of vertices. But for Colorado, I had 835 vertices, even though it's supposed to only be 697 sides. So I think in some cases where state boundary hit a county boundary, they added an extra vertex and did not have time to go and figure out what one means. But it's not four, I can tell you that. All right, so here's Colorado in all its glory of different projections. Um, so what shape is Colorado with its 697 sides? Um, maybe an isosceles trapezoid. You could say isosceles trapezoid, but that still applies to four sides. So the article I read from Big Think, I'm not even going to try. Hexa, hecta, Anna. Contact, <laughs> I can't even say it. Um, they did the homework of the Greek prefixes. Uh, apparently, 697 sided polygon is that. Wow. Or we can just go with the polygon, yeah. which is also Greek in origin, um, but a lot easier to say. Polygon. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, we are hoping to have some more fun state stories, maybe for GIS Day. Our next two Volunteers from the Centroid have picked Washington and Ohio. And then uh, I had a couple of folks from the history department who seemed intrigued. And so hopefully I can get them to help out and maybe do some as well. Um, so that's all we have, 1240. I said 1245, we're five minutes. Um, so that's all we have. We have lots of other events. So check out our, our webpage, um, gis.colostate.edu. And if you have special requests for states, We'll see what we can do. <laughs> I'm going to stop that share. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. We had, I think, eight or so people online, so that's a good crowd. And thanks, Marcy. I'm so glad you could come. She's my friend. She lives in Olympia. She's not even here. She lives where? Olympia. Um, cool. All right. Well, have a great day, everyone. And uh, next week, by the way, next Thursday, Cat in a Polygon. It's about disaster and catastrophe modeling by uh, Todd Barr, who's the geospatial director of geospatial products at Veris. So that actually will be really cool stuff like modeling hurricanes and assessing risk and how it impacts insurance and like all that type of stuff. So some pretty cool stuff. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Yeah. 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 Yeah.